In August of 1945, the city of Hiroshima was destroyed in about nine seconds by a single atomic bomb. The man responsible for building the bomb was a gentle and eloquent physicist named J. Robert Oppenheimer. This is the story of Robert Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. Stinson Beach, California, August 7th, 1945. Dear Oppie, you are probably the most famous man in the world today, and yet I am not sure that this letter will reach you. But if it does, I want you to know that we are very proud of you. And if it doesn't, you will know it anyway. We have been irritated by your reticence these past few years, but under the itchy surface, we knew that it was all right, that the work was progressing, that the heart was still there, and the warm being we have known and cherished. I can understand now, as I could guess then, the somber note in you during our last meetings. There is a weight in such a venture which few men in history have had to bear. I know that with your love of men, it is no light thing to have had a part and a great part in a diabolical contrivance for destroying them. But in the possibilities of death are also the possibilities of life. You have made history. We are happy for you. You may well ask why uh, uh, people with a kind heart and hum humanist feelings, why they would uh, go and work on weapons of mass destruction. When J. Robert Oppenheimer was born in 1904, the atomic bomb was not yet even science fiction. He was educated at the Ethical Culture School in New York and mastered Harvard's curriculum in three years, summa cum laude. He spoke six languages and seriously considered becoming an architect, a poet, or a scientist. But it was his love of physics that led him to England and Germany in the 1920s, where the atom was beginning to yield its secrets to Einstein, Rutherford, and Bourne. European scientists would later remember him as the quick and eccentric young American who devoured both theoretical physics and 16th century French poetry. One of his best friends was the young American writer, Francis Ferguson. Well, when I first knew him, he knew nothing about politics. He never read the newspaper. Uh, he was extremely ignorant about practical matters, and he didn't care about them. Uh, and uh, his whole life was in the intellect. At the age of 25, he accepted an unusual dual professorship at the University of California at Berkeley and at Caltech in Pasadena. He brought with him the radically new understanding of the atom and the principles of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was comparatively new then, and it was, he was opening a new world to them, and he made it tremendous, tremendously exciting and fascinating to them. And in fact, very few of them didn't, take, didn't come back and take it a second year. <laughs> One of his graduate students was Robert Serber. I think there was I remember one Russian lady, Miss Kokcharova, her name was, who had taken it three times. In the fourth year, she wanted to come back, and, and Robert told, refused to allow her into the course. She went on a hunger strike <laughs> and forced her way in. <laughs> Something that might have taken me months to have learned before, he would go over in minutes. And, uh, Robert Wilson, physicist. Very fast clip and uh, very elegant uh, manner. He was extremely quick and very impatient and had a very sharp tongue, which he used on people. He actually terrorized the students when he first began to teach. They were afraid to come into the same room for fear of a nasty remark. 
Robert Oppenheimer and his younger brother Frank were born into a wealthy family and raised in New York City. Throughout the 1930s, they spent their summers with friends at a small ranch leased by the Oppenheimer family, high in the Pecos wilderness of northern New Mexico. Uh, when, when we first went there, uh, we slept on the floor, a board floor, and we didn't have enough covers and we were pretty frozen by morning, but <laughs> that didn't bother Robert much. He was a fairly hardy fellow, although he didn't look that way. He looked terribly frail, but he was pretty tough. He eventually explored a large part of those mountains, probably knew more about them than almost anybody else. And he would just get on his horse and put a chocolate bar in his pocket and be gone for a day or two, at least. Sleeping out, probably would see nobody else during the whole trip. Everything my brother did was sort of the special. If he went off in the woods to take a leak, he'd come back with a flower. And not to disguise the fact that it might leak, but just to make it an occasion, I guess. It was a wonderful time for all of us. All the different guests, most of them physicists, uh, uh, brought some, some ideas and new ideas with them. Also, um, we, the meals were sort of strange, sort of peanut butter and Vienna sausages and whiskey. And we'd get sort of drunk when we were high up, and we'd all act kind of silly, I guess. <laughs> I'd never been on a horse in my life. <laughs> he, he, so, so, they gave us maps, and they sent us off on this uh, three-day <laughs> trip you know, over the mountain. Mountain passes are 12,500 feet. He went out with an absolute minimum of, uh, of equipment, you know, a bottle of whiskey and some graham crackers <laughs> and food and oats for the horses. It was the rainy season. Finally, it, we noticed it didn't rain quite as much at night. So we started to ride at night. And I don't know uh, what we gained from riding at night because it also rained at night. Imagine this, you're, you're I was riding on a mountain ridge at midnight in the middle of a thunderstorm with lightning hitting all around you. You come to a fork in the road in the trail, and Robert says, this way it's only seven miles home. This way it's a little longer, but it's much more beautiful. <laughs> But far from the Pecos wilderness, far from Berkeley, was Adolf Hitler. And Robert Oppenheimer was a Jew with friends and relatives in Germany. He did not keep up with current events. He read novels or he read philosophy books or serious books. But uh, all of a sudden, and I think it was due in large part to uh, Hitler and to the Nazi persecution of the, Jew, of the Jews, that he suddenly... Uh, I think it must have been fairly suddenly, he suddenly realized that things were getting out of hand and that something had to be done about it by serious people. So he began reading. Hokan Chevalier was a professor of French literature at Berkeley, active in left-wing causes. He and Oppenheimer grew to be close friends. On one of his many trips to the East, on the train, he had taken the three volumes of Das Kapital and he had read them all in the original on his way to New York. In German? In German, yes. And uh, then shortly after, apparently, he bought the complete works of Lenin and read those. He was a tremendous intellect. I don't believe I have known another person who was quite so quick in comprehending. Hans Bethe, Nobel laureate. Uh, in comprehending both scientific and general knowledge. At uh, Berkeley, he'd read the Bhagavad Gita and learned Sanskrit, and was really taken by the, by the charm and the kind of general wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. And some people seem to think he was, uh, got very religiously involved in it, but that's not a true, true at all. Either. The late 1930s, while America endured a Great Depression, fascism seethed in Germany. A civil war raged in Spain, 
and Oppenheimer moved further to the left. Kitty Harrison was a communist and had lost her first husband in the Spanish Civil War. In 1940, she and Robert Oppenheimer were married. Shortly before then, Robert's brother Frank and his wife Jackie had joined the Communist Party in California. Robert, not a joiner, stayed aloof from formal association, but his left-wing activities did attract official attention. As war clouds gathered in Europe, the FBI added Oppenheimer's name to a list of people to be imprisoned in the of national emergency. Back in 1938, uh, Hahn and Strassmann in Germany discovered fission. And many people realized very quickly that it might be possible to make atomic bombs, to use fission uh, as an explosive, to use uranium as an explosive. I first heard about it, but I think Niels Bohr told me. I think it was in Princeton. And when I came back to Colombia and I told Enrico Fermi about it, by uh, the end of the day, he had calculated the, uh, uh, the depth of a crater, the size of a crater, of which one pound would, uh, would give exploding. The first I heard about fission was uh, a letter from Oppenheimer. And the news had just gotten to Berkeley, and he, he, he wrote to me. I gave a seminar on it that same day at, uh, at uh, Urbana. I mean, I mean one, it was one of these ideas, you know, uh, once somebody told you, you say, how could I be so stupid not to have seen that before? And, <coughs> and I think even in the first letter, he mentioned the possibility of making bomb. I suppose that... Freeman Dyson, physicist. He was at that time profoundly impressed with the precariousness of the Allied situation, that after all, most of his friends were Europeans, many of them in countries which had been occupied by the Germans. The Germans looked as though they were the wave of the future at that time. He said this, the danger that this may mean the end of Western civilization. My brother viewed it as not just something persecuting uh, our own uh, relatives, but as a kind of thing that could be a wave that would walk over the United States as well. He wanted to help. He thought probably the best way to do this, where he had most competence, would be in uh, the atomic bomb work. And therefore, it was natural for him, almost necessary for him, that this is where he would put his effort. He built the atomic bomb, or he didn't build it, but he led the effort to build the atomic bomb because he thought this was necessary to save Western civilization. It was feared that Nazi scientists were already building an atomic bomb in 1939 when Albert Einstein informed President Roosevelt that such a thing was even possible. The program Roosevelt initiated was small and had little momentum until December 7, 1941. The day after Pearl Harbor, America declared war on Japan and Germany. We had on the one side this crazy nation and this demon in Germany. I, I, Robbie. And uh, these funny people who didn't know what the Western world was about to tackle the United States. I mean, there was no question in my mind that this something had to be done. And furthermore, we weren't winning at all. I was caught up in the war effort and, and with a patriotic fever that it's hard to imagine nowadays. It's been so long since uh, anything of that kind has motivated uh, America, seems to have motivated Americans 
and one would have done anything that was necessary to get on with the war. The bomb project had a sudden urgency. The U.S. Army was given charge and codenamed it the Manhattan District, with General Leslie Groves in command, and secret laboratories scattered across the country. Groves put Oppenheimer in charge of a group at Berkeley to explore the basic scientific requirements of an atomic bomb. Oppenheimer, who had taken to wearing a rakish pork pie hat, took pleasure in his new official title, Coordinator of Rapid Rupture. That was the time when the, the big change in his life occurred. And it must have been during that time that the dream somehow got hold of him of really producing a nuclear weapon, which other people had been talking about, that he was the fellow who really did it. It is a very different uh, attitude if you want to find out the deep secrets of nature, which is what he had wanted to do before. And on the other hand, if you want to to produce something, to produce a mechanism that works. It was a different problem, different attitude, and he completely changed to fit the new role. The Los Alamos Boys School, high on a mesa 50 miles north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, not far from the Oppenheimer Ranch, in the summer of 1942, students began to notice low-flying military aircraft overhead. One student was Sterling Colgate. It was in the fall of 42 when uh, this place was invaded by uh, uh, an, an armada of uh, bulldozers and construction crew. Uh, it suddenly, we uh, knew that the war had arrived here, and these two uh, characters showed up, uh, a Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. Uh, one wearing a pork pie hat and the other a, a suit and a normal hat. And these two guys went around as if, uh, uh, well, one, they owned the place, which evidently they did, but more than that, as if their pseudonyms was a normal sort of thing to do. My God, I mean, there their pictures were in our, in our physics book, and we all had physics. One is the lead theoretical physicist of his age, and the other, uh, uh, head of a major laboratory who had done the cyclotron and things like that. So we immediately knew that, one, uh, uh, they felt that it was so important to be Oppenheimer and Lawrence that they had to have a pseudonym. Uh, two, that they were putting megabucks, uh, multi-megabucks, into what seemed to us the worst place in the world to have a laboratory. Granting Oppenheimer's request for a single isolated lab where the bomb could be designed and built, General Groves appropriated the remote school and officially named Oppenheimer scientific director. Oppenheimer's first job was to convince scientists and their families to join him for the duration of the war in a place he was not allowed to identify, to work on a project he was not always allowed to describe. Well, I was a young assistant professor the University of Wisconsin. In Stan Ulam, mathematician, and his wife, Francoise. Uh, the war was on. I noticed that some other younger colleagues, especially, was disappearing from town. They couldn't tell where they were going. It was very secret. But when I learned that I'm supposed to go somewhere to New Mexico, uh, Francoise uh, wanted to know about the state of New Mexico. So I went to the library and borrowed one of these WPA books on various states, and there was one volume on New Mexico. And then, looking at it, I noticed at the back of the book there was a list of previous borrowers. To my amazement, several names of people who just disappeared a week or two before were put down there as borrowers. Robert Porton was a private in the Army. And I don't know how many people uh, viewing this program ever had the pleasure of getting off a train at Lamy, New Mexico, but uh, we looked at it as if it were out of Siberia. It was very strange. There was nothing but uh, a lot of sand, sagebrush, and but there was a GI vehicle, and, a, and we 
got in, still wondering where we were and why we were there. Scientific and military personnel arrive from all over America, many traveling under assumed names. A station master in Princeton, New Jersey, was baffled at the sudden demand for one-way tickets to the tiny station outside Santa Fe. It was a little bit awe-inspiring to be in the middle of nowhere like this and not knowing what we were getting into, uh, not the slightest idea. Next stop for newly arrived personnel was an inconspicuous building in Santa Fe. Dorothy McKibben was in charge of the tiny office. Santa Fe was full of young FBI agents, middle-aged agents. And to some of us, they were quite discernible because they were so well-dressed. What did they do? They uh, wore gray slacks and tweed jackets and shirt with necktie, and they leaned against the walls of buildings, and they hung around La Fonda and the Capital Pharmacy and all restaurants. We drove through Santa Fe and then a place called Española and then hit some dips in the road and then started to climb. And I had never been in mountainous country. It was very interesting. I had just finished reading The Mount Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. And of course, uh, to go to this mysterious mountain on the top of which there would be a secret laboratory uh, in which we would go into, the doors would slam, and uh, a few years later, why we would come out bearing an atomic bomb. Very impressive, strange scenery, mountains, rocks, the desert. We crossed Rio Grande and arrived in a place full of little, well, how to call it, almost huts. Oppenheimer had brought scientists and their families fresh from distinguished campuses all over the country. Ivied halls, soaring campaniles, vaulted chapels. Los Alamos was a boom town. Hastily constructed wooden buildings, dirt streets, coal stoves, and only five bathtubs. There were no sidewalks. The streets were all dirt. The water situation was always bad. One young physicist was Robert Crone. It was not at all unusual to open your faucet and have worms come out. Everybody was wearing Western clothes, jeans, boots, parkas. There was a feeling of mountain resort in addition to army camp. And the mixture was unbelievable. And then there was the awful mud. The physicist Edward Teller had brought a piano and played Beethoven late into the night. From his cramped quarters in a four-family dwelling, he could disturb more Nobel laureates at once than he could have anywhere else in the world. Oppenheimer had gathered the elite in physics, mathematics, and chemistry to build the atomic bomb. I don't believe there was ever before an assembly of so many first-rate people for one task. They, in turn, recruited their best students, promising kids working side by side with Nobel laureates. There was no class distinction between the small fry and the big shots. When I first came to the, the, to the United States, I got to know a lot of the young people who had been at Los Alamos. Most of them were very young. They'd just gone right into it without even finishing their scientific training. And for them, it was just the most marvelous time of their lives. People worked hard, scientists worked around the clock, and the people made up for the lack of big city life, and it was a lot of partying. We were very young, and it was just like a camp out. Liquor was short in the area, so in order to spice up the parties, we use lab alcohol. Lab alcohol is 200 proof, basically, which is just exactly what you're looking for for punch. If you were in a large hall and you saw several groups of people, the largest groups would be hovering around Oppenheimer. He was great at a party, and women simply loved him and still do. 
I found it extremely dashing in a sort of uh, elegant way. It was, for these young people, not only a great experience, it was also fun. It was, it was a lark. Yes, it was a good time. It was a good time in America. It was a good time to be American. It was a, a time when the whole country was pulling together uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a cause which even now I think was just. That is the idea that the Nazis would, uh, uh, Nazi Germany would win that war could have uh, led to, uh, I, it seemed to me, a thousand years of dark ages and everything that we meant by civilization could have come to an end. That's what it seemed to me was what the fight was about, or something pretty close to that. And most Americans felt that, and most Americans were in it just as, uh, as hard as they could be. Their average age was 29, and their job was to construct a mechanism which would trigger in a millionth of a second a violent chain reaction. They had two dance bands, a soda fountain, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a radio station with no call letters, a cyclotron, and 7,000 fire extinguishers. Somehow, Oppenheimer put this thing together. He was the conductor of the orchestra or whatever it was. Somehow he created this fantastic esprit. No matter who you talk to, they all lived it, and, and they all, I think, almost without exception, felt it most strongly that without him this wouldn't have happened, it couldn't have happened. Oppenheimer had envisioned a small community of 30 scientists and their families, but by 1944 he was in charge of a walled city of 6,000. The cost escalated to $56 million. Seven divisions, theoretical physics, experimental physics, ordnance, explosives, bomb physics, chemistry and metallurgy. He knew and understood everything that went on in the laboratory, whether it was chemistry or theoretical physics or machine shop. He could keep it all in his head and coordinate it. It was clear, also at Los Alamos, that he was intellectually superior to us. The most striking contradiction is the fact that this man, who was so unworldly, so unpolitical in his youth, such a great scholar, so fond of metaphysical poetry, should suddenly emerge as the great administrator who put Los Alamos together and produced the atomic bomb. I saw him change from that uh, almost irresponsible intellectual bohemian... And person, radical. Radical person that he was that I, and that I had known at, at Berkeley, uh, to someone who was just completely dedicated to getting on with the war. I think it was a real stroke of genius on part of General Groves, who was not generally considered to be a genius, uh, to have appointed him. It was a most improbable appointment. I was astonished. The professor and the general made an unlikely team. When Groves took charge of the Manhattan Project in 1942, there was barely enough plutonium in the world to cover the head of a pin, and very little uranium-235. These were the only elements that could fuel the Los Alamos bomb. To produce U-235, Groves built a secret 44-acre building in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In Hanford, Washington, giant reactors labored to produce a few pounds of plutonium. It was the most expensive scientific project in the history of the world. General Groves distrusted liberals, and yet in spite of Oppenheimer's well-documented leftist background, Groves overruled the astonished security officers who tried to block Oppenheimer's clearance. He had arguments with Gen General Groves, but I think they were mostly about sort of trivial things like that the fact that people were having too many babies, and uh, he couldn't do anything about that. And uh, when things came up, um, that were really important. I think General Crowes usually supported him. He had to support Robert himself against the uh, intelligence people who, of course, well, in fact, they not only wouldn't have cleared Robert, they obviously wouldn't have cleared three quarters of the people on the, uh, at, at the place. So, Why not? Hmm? Well, they, I mean, they were all moderately liberal, <laughs> moderately left-wing people. It 
It was a new and strange world. Barbed wire, bodyguards, censored letters, secrets from their wives and children. Well, I'd written, try to be so newsy when I was in Fort Leonard Wood, and when I came here, I would write and say, I'm out here in the West, and the scenery is beautiful, and the weather is just gorgeous. And my mother would write back and say, well, where are you really, and what are you doing? And I would write back and say, I'm out here in the West, and the weather is gorgeous, and the scenery is beautiful. And she never understood that until the war was over, and I could explain it to her. And you heard throughout the town that they were joking and saying it's a submarine base to make windshield wipers for submarines, or it was a Navy installation or, or something like that. And they thought it was a great joke. G2 wanted a rumor spread in Santa Fe with her, you know, all kinds of speculation about what was going on at Los Alamos. They wanted to get out rumors. We were busy making electric rockets. And, and we, we tried it. We went down and uh, we tried to La Fonda Bar, which is usually crowded. Of course, that night it was you know, half deserted. <laughs> And we talked as loudly as we could about electric rockets, but nobody seemed to pay any attention. <laughs> so then we d went out to a workman's bar, <laughs> much rougher, and uh, sure would dance. And some, some uh, Spanish-American came along and asked her to dance. She was trying to tell him about Los Alamos, and he was trying to tell her that he, what he wanted was a ranch to raise horses. <laughs> he couldn't have been less interested. <laughs> And finally, I grabbed the guy at the bar, and I took him by <laughs> lapels and shook him and said, you know what we're doing at lapel. <laughs> he was so drunk, I'm sure he didn't remember a word of it. <laughs> the complete flop. It's not as easy as it sounds to be a spy. <laughs> back in Berkeley, an industrial scientist named George Eltonton had approached Oppenheimer's old friend Hokan Chevalier in 1943 with a request that Chevalier convince Oppenheimer to share secrets with Russian scientists. Chevalier refused, and when Oppenheimer passed through Berkeley on secret business, Chevalier told him about the incident. I told Oppenheimer that uh, this uh, was not something that uh, he could do anything about and that uh, if there were to be such exchanges, it would have to be proposed on the highest levels of government, and it would have to be worked out in that way. And, and he agreed that uh, this would not be any, there was no, no possibility of doing anything. And that is all. And uh, I forgot about it, and I think that he forgot about it for a long time, too. This seemingly insignificant conversation would later have enormous impact on the lives of both men. In late 1944, American intelligence learned that the German atomic bomb effort had failed. Nevertheless, shortly afterwards, Los Alamos scientists picked up the pace and began working six-day weeks. Where everything was coming together, everything was going at a very rapid rate. We were building up to the Trinity test at that time. We were uh, a great deal of production with of uh, devices to be used in the atomic bomb were being made. Everybody was working day and night. And it was very hard in the, you know, in the push to make that uh, test uh, to stop and think. I said, what do you young men do in the evening for pleasure? And they said, we go back to the lab and stay till midnight. <laughs> As one would, I remember I would walk all, work almost every every night, so I'd uh, nearly drop, then go home, sleep a bit, and then come back, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, just constantly working. Across the Pacific, the war raged on against Japan, but in the spring of 45, there was victory in Europe. The Nazis had never come close to building an atomic bomb. Germany surrendered. V.E. Day. Eisenhower returned triumphant. I would like to, have, to think now that, uh, that I, uh, at the time of the German defeat, that uh, I would have stopped, taken stock, thought it all over very carefully, and that I would have walked away from uh, Los Alamos at that time. And I've, 
in terms of all of my, everything that I believe in, before and during and after the war, I cannot understand why I did not take that, make that act. On the other hand, it simply was not in the air. I do not know of a single instance of anyone who had made that suggestion or who did leave at the time. It, there might have been someone that I didn't know, but uh, at the time, it just was not uh, something that uh, was part of our lives. We were, our life was directed to do one thing. It's as though we had been programmed to do that, and we, as automatons, were doing it. Amazing how the technology tools trap one. I mean, uh, they're so powerful that when I, w I was impressed because most of the sort of fervor for developing the bomb came in a kind of anti-fascist fervor against Germany. But when VE Day came along, nobody slowed up one little bit. No one said, ah, oh, well, the main thing, well, it doesn't matter now. We all kept working, and it wasn't because we understood the significance against Japan. It was because the, the machinery had caught us in its trap, and we were anxious to get this thing to go. I organized a, 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 a small meeting at our building. I think the title was The Impact of the Gadget on Civilization. Hoppy uh, tried to persuade me not to have it. I don't know quite why, but he certainly did try to dis dissuade me. On the other hand, uh, I went ahead and did hold the meeting, and perhaps between 30 and 50 people came. Hoppy came too which uh, added a certain, uh, always added a tone to any meeting. Uh, we did discuss whether we should go on or not, and in the context of what was happening in the world. Of course, it was called in the context that perhaps what we were, what we were doing was uh, morally wrong. Particularly, Oppie pointed out that, uh, but it would be well that the world knew about the possibility of an atomic bomb, rather than it be something that would be kept secret while the uh, uh, United Nations was being formed. On that basis, on that logical basis, we all decided that that was right and that we ought to go back in the laboratory and work as hard as we could to demonstrate a nuclear uh, weapon uh, before the, uh, uh, so that the United Nations would be set up in the awareness of this horrible thing to come. The Faustian bargain is when you sell your soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge and power. And that, of course, in a way, is what Oppenheimer did, there's no doubt. He made this alliance with the United States Army in the person of General Groves, who gave him undreamed of resources, huge armies of people and as much money as he could possibly spend in order to do physics on the grand scale in order to create this marvelous weapon. And it was a Faustian bargain, if ever there was one. And of course, we are still living with it ever since. When once you sell your soul to the devil, then there's no going back on it. Well, I can't tell you exactly, but right over there between here and the, Os and the uh, high part of the Oscura Mountains, there where that little peak is on the McDonald Ranch is where they detonated the first atomic bomb. <clears throat> what was this country like then? About like it is now. 200 miles south of Los Alamos, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, a vast unbroken stretch of prairie. Here Robert Oppenheimer chose to test the first atomic bomb. He named the place Trinity Site it had been Apache country, but in late 44, it was populated only by a handful of cattle ranchers and homesteaders. They called it by the Spanish name, Jornada del Muerto, the journey of death. Dave McDonald. Uh, I was put out of here in 42. Who put you out of here? Uh, the Corps of Engineers and federal judge and so forth, and they said they had to have it for air to air gunnery range and so forth, you see. And later on, why it wound up being this, you see, when they got the atomic bomb to work in why they come in for a place and then they selected this right here. 
that time they were living, that is the people that was assembling this bomb and preparing to shoot it was there at my place. Somewhere around five to 700 people they said there. And uh, living in my house and around it and so forth, you see, with other buildings and so forth. It began with 15 men in December. By May, there were several hundred civilians and GIs working in secret. At night, nearby ranchers heard gunfire. GIs hunting antelope with submachine guns. About 1939, I think it was, on the front piece of Time magazine, they had a picture of an atom buster at the University of California. And when they shipped the shell in for this experimental detonation down here, why, I thought, I said, if I didn't think I was crazy or something, I'd think maybe they're uh, fooling around with uh, busting atoms or doing something with <laughs> atomic power. But it, and I was just talking because I certainly didn't know anything about it. I had no conception of what an atomic bomb was or what the, the violence of it and the strength of it. When I arrived there, they, uh, they were in the process of, in the end of May of constructing a 100-foot tall tower in this desert, which was really a very empty, very, it wasn't sandy, but it was a typical dry, sagebrushy desert with one wall off to the east of rock and a base camp, which had a couple of extra buildings, but which really was just uh, some old ranch houses. People were feverishly setting up wires all over the desert, building the tower, building little huts in which to put cameras and house people um, at the time the bomb went off. The, the army had just accidentally bombed the place a little bit before I got there, but nobody was hurt. The work had been so frantic that it was a relief to know that it was coming to a conclusion. And we knew that they were preparing the big experiment to see if the gadget, as it was called, would work. What did you expect? I uh, hope, I'm, I, what did I expect? Francoise Ulam. I was, had mixed feelings. I expected, wanted it to succeed because it would help to end the war. I didn't want it to be dangerous. There was a, of course, it was, there was a chance that it would be very dangerous, could be very dangerous. The 11th of July, 1945, an unmarked Pontiac sedan arrives at the McDonald Ranch carrying the world's entire supply of plutonium, about 10 pounds. The courier demands a receipt, approximate value, $1 billion. At Oppenheimer's request, General Groves has made a secret arrangement with the governor of New Mexico to evacuate the state in case of catastrophe. Now, prior to the shot, back in the lab, there had been some speculation that it might be possible to explode the atmosphere, in which case the world disappears. Did you sense uh, a lot of anxiety in your brother? A, lo a lot of anxiety in everybody, including my brother, um, both whether it would work or not work. Uh, Frank Oppenheimer, uh, physicist. I think mostly uh, that, but also um, it was, you see, it was a time in which um, I think it, his interest in, in using the bomb to pr help produce a better world pre was, 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 didn't happen just after the war. But he really had hoped that Truman would tell Stalin about it fairly forthrightly. Of course, that didn't happen and set the stage almost at that instant to the Cold War rather than to an, a, a warmer uh, uh, humanity. And so I think both of those things seemed Everything there was worrying him a great deal. There was, there was building up tremendous, uh, almost hysterical uh, anxiety. Uh, many people feeling that we couldn't possibly hold the test because every time we tested some component that had to do with the test, it would fail. Everybody was rushing around. Uh, things did not appear to be ready. Yet uh, there did seem to be a certain uh, momentum to the work that was going on that we would uh, make a test. I think it had been put back several times, but uh, on July 16th that there would be the test come hell or high water. Memo, 11 July, 1700 hours. 
both charges completely papered. Work another night shift if necessary to complete this job. Request personnel as necessary. Memo, 12 July, 1600 hours. Seal all holds in case. Wrap with scotch wrap. Box charges, inner and outer, with two spares for each. Memo, 13 July, 1300 hours. Assembly starts. Remove polar cap and dummy plug. Gadget now belongs to tamper people. G engineers work until 1600 with active material insertion. Dummy plug hole is covered with a clean cloth and explosives people take over. Insert HE. This is to be done as slowly as the G engineers wish. Remove all chains. Clear the deck. Well, I expected that what they were working on, they were going to try. Fourteen July, 0800 hours. Rig guidelines, lift to tower top. Ready for X unit at 0900. Bring up G engineer's footstool. Fourteen July, 0900 hours. Wiring of the X unit proceeds under the direction of the explosives people. Tower platform should be tested with concrete weight as per Oppenheimer. Detonators placed to conform with requirements of informer switches. HE people stand by to criticize potential rough handling. Note that once detonators are on sphere, no live electrical connection can be brought to the X unit, informer unit, or anywhere else on the sphere. All testing must be done before sphere is lifted to tower. After that, it is too late. 14 July, 1700 hours. Gadget complete. Should we have the chaplain here? The betting pool cost a dollar. Edward Teller bet on a blast equal to 45,000 tons of TNT. Oppenheimer bet low, 3,000 tons. And I.I. Robbie put his money on 20 kilotons. Young technicians were horrified to overhear Enrico Fermi taking side bets on the possibility of incinerating the state of New Mexico. The test was set at midnight. The prediction was there'd be 60 mile visibility and a certain wind pattern. Well, at mid midnight, it was raining cats and dogs, lightning and thunder, really scared about this object there in the tower. It'd be set off accidentally. So the, you can imagine the strain on Oppenheimer, on Robert Oppenheimer, this. I remember it was one of my uh, uh, memories of that time, having to go up the, the tower to turn on a piece of equipment. So I was one of the last, not the last person by any means, but one of the last people to get our equipment that was right next to the bomb, uh, I would have, have it all turned on and tested before, uh, before starting the test. And uh, it was quite dramatic because lightning was striking all around. It was a, quite a fierce storm going on. In particular, one had a certain amount of respect uh, for that atomic bomb being right next as sparks seemed to be flying. Uh, did give me a little bit of a uh, sense of apprehension. <laughs> um, I think he and I were lying down right next to each other, flat in the desert, right outside the, the um, control hut um, at the time the bomb went off. And we had prepared ourselves with glass, and uh, it, when we, we could hear the countdown, when it went off, we all were looking through the glass, and then we saw what was just a tremendous uh, 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 overpowering uh, vision of this thing happening, seeing the mountains small beside it, seeing perhaps with some kind of beauty, but awesome was what I would call it, as it slowly developed, went up in the air, and uh, made those, the whole desert light up as at noon, and appear small, a large desert the rim by mountains appear to be a small place. And that was just something that uh, once that had happened, uh, I was a different person from then on.
at the time it went off, it was, I think, absolutely, it wasn't, I knew sort of what would happen, but I didn't expect the heat from the flash at five miles away to be uh, nearly that intense. And then there was a cloud, sort of the radioactive cloud went and sort of hovered there. And I and Ken had been working on developing escape routes because if that thing had gone a little bit uh, south, it would have fallen then fall out on the camp and we would have to get out to the to the south rather than where the north was the road was to the north and um, so there was this sense of this ominous cloud uh, hanging over us it was so brilliant purple with all the radioactive glowing and it just seemed to hang there forever of course it didn't it, went, it was, must have been just a very short time for it, until it went up but it was very terrifying and the thunder from the blast um, it bounced on the rocks and then went, I don't know where else it bounced, but it never seemed to stop, not like an ordinary echo of a thunder. It just kept echoing back and forth in that Giornato del Muerto. It was a very scary time when it, when it went off. Um, and God, I wish I could remember what my brother said, but um, I can't. Or, but I think we just said it worked. <laughs> I think that's what we said, both of us. It worked, and nobody knew it was going to work. He was in the uh, in the forward bunker, and then when he came back, there he was. You know, of his hat. You've seen pictures of that Robert's hat and so on. And uh, he came to where we were in the in the headquarters, so to speak. And um, the way his walk was like high noon. I think it's the best I could describe it, this kind of strut. So. He'd done it. It felt like an earthquake. We lived in a good adobe house, and it just said, shh, shh. And he said, my goodness, that's an earthquake, and wonder if it hurt the house. And he got out of bed, and he got up, and he says, I want you to come look. The sun's rising in the long, wrong direction. Must have been nearly 20 miles away. Well, this is if somebody had set off a flash bulb right in your face, you know, completely blinded for, for about 30 seconds. Then gradually your vision cleared and you saw this huge orange and purple and green <laughs> violently colored balls rolling up towards the sky. So. We knew something that happened over here, and we had a car along, had a radio in it. So we kept that radio on, and long at noon, they up and told us, you know, that there's an ammunition that went off. We were headed up to Albuquerque to take her back to school, and we were between Palvadera and Limitar when we saw this great big flash of light. And my sister, she said, what happened? And that was, she got to see the light, and it just seemed like it lit up the whole prairie all around us. Was there anything odd about your sister asking about the light? Yes, because she was blind. It didn't take very long. I was just after the first few minutes that I realized sort of viscerally what had happened and uh, had goose flesh all over, of, the, of the consequences of what, what would happen to the world. When did you find out what happened? Well, it was quite a while, you know, and until they began to talk about the cattle, you know, that the hair was turning white on them, like frost, you know, it looked like they had frost on their backs and so forth. The way we noticed them was the, uh, where that fallout fell on the cow, if she's lying on her left side, while well, her right side would get burned, and the uh, particles of dust that were radioactive would fall on her, and then they caused a burn like a scald, and the hair, instead of coming back red, like on a Hereford cow, would come back white, just like a a saddle burn on a black horse. And old man Max Smith that had the white store up there had a black cat just as black as the ace of spades. And that thing had white spots all over it after the atomic blast. He sold it to some tourist for $5, I think, as a curiosity. Iwo Jima, Lady Gulf, Mindanao, the Marshall Islands. At Okinawa alone, 50,000 American casualties, 110,000 Japanese casualties.
the beginning of the end for Japan. Saturation bombing. Thousands of B-29s raining incendiary bombs on all but a few cities. Harry Truman, who has assumed the presidency after Roosevelt's death in early 45, calls for total surrender. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. Japan was in ruins, most of her major cities destroyed, reduced to rubble. More than a million civilians dead, the Japanese fought on. Now, when the question of use came up, then I did have quite long discussions with Oppie uh, about how it might be used. And he did bring up to me one day that he would serve on a panel uh, to make a recommendation about the use of the bomb. So then uh, uh, I suggested to him that it would be a good idea if it would be used in a demonstration. Uh, uh, for example, as the, as the demonstration at Trinity, where Japanese observers might have been invited to attend. And I can remember very specifically when Oppenheimer brought up a counter argument to that, that, well, supposing it didn't go off, and I turned to him coldly and said, well, we could kill them all. <laughs> and of course, I was not, uh, didn't say that for real. But even so, I was aghast at having even uh, to make a point that I had said such a bloodthirsty thing. Why did the bomb get dropped on people at Hiroshima? I would say it's almost inevitable that it would have happened, simply because all the bureaucratic apparatus existed by that time to do it. The Air Force was ready and waiting. There had been prepared big airfields in the island of Tinian in the Pacific from which you could operate. The whole machinery was ready. The president would have had to be a man of iron will in order to put a stop to it. The question was whether we wanted to save our people and Japanese as well and win the war or whether we wanted to take a chance on being able to win the war by killing all our young men. I don't think they would have developed that to show at a garden party. I think they had to do it and we felt this was our own defense. And also there was a hurricane that would have wiped out a lot of our troops out there. And the poor old Japanese hadn't been very nice to us, John. They kind of demolished our Navy without any warning. It would have come out sooner or later in a congressional hearing, if nowhere else, just when we could have dropped the bomb if we didn't use it. And then uh, knowing American politics, you know as well as I do that uh, there been elections fought on the basis that every mother whose son was killed after such and such a date, uh, the blood is on the head of the president. Americans braced themselves for a bloody invasion of the Japanese mainland. And uh, in those days, most people did not realize the qualitative difference between the atomic bomb and the number of ordinary bombs. There was really no uh, immediate feeling that the world is changing as a result, but rather that it would be a good way to win the war more quickly. So I would say it was nobody's fault that the bomb was dropped. As usual, the reason it was dropped was just that nobody had the courage or the foresight to say no. Certainly not Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer gave his consent in a certain sense. He was on a committee which advised the Secretary of War, and that committee did not take any kind of a stand against dropping the bomb. Of course, we never expected, I don't think even the people who were doing the testing expected, uh, the, the, the bomb to be thrown on Japan so fast. Hiroshima, a city the size of Houston, one of the few cities spared the firebombing. Months earlier, orders had been given to leave several Japanese cities untouched to provide virgin targets where the effects of the new bomb could be clearly seen.
the um, it, the the announcement that of Hiroshima. I think I was in the hall right outside my brother's office, and it came over the sort of loudspeaker that went through, was distributed throughout, um, that the bomb had been dropped and that it had devastated, and that had, so the first reaction was, thank God it wasn't a dud. But before the whole sentence of the broadcast was finished, when Sutton got this horror of all the people that had been killed. Uh, and I don't know why, up to then, I don't think we'd really, I'd really thought of all those flattened people. Um, we had talked often about having a demonstration where there weren't people, maybe on the mainland so that the military would see it, but where there weren't people. And then, that they had, that they'd actually dropped it on a place where all those people were, and the image of those people, which came before any pictures of it, uh, really was pretty awful. But the first thing was, I'm sure, was, thank God it worked. The first reaction which we had was one of fulfillment. Now it has been done. Now the work that we have been engaged in for so many years has contributed to the war. The second reaction was, of course, one of shock and horror. What have we done? What have we done? And the third reaction, it shouldn't be done again. You were very depressed. I came back from San Francisco and uh, found you very depressed. You, in, 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 a, as a, in opposition to your euphoria when the war, uh, the, uh, at VE Day, when we had that very nice party and uh, you started throwing the garbage cans around. Ah, uh, you were uh, very depressed, and uh, we didn't have a party. I think there was a party. I don't even know if we went. Mm -hmm. Were you depressed? Yes. Oh, yes, I depressed. remember being just ill with the... Uh, just sick. Uh, sick with the, to the, at the point that I thought it would be, <clears throat> uh, you know, vomit. I was so uh, overwhelmed when it happened that uh, that, that thing had happened. Still am. <laughs> What was, what was Robert's reaction to the news from Hiroshima? I, th I don't know. I, th uh, I, I can't imagine that it was very different. A, a, a feeling that, uh, an initial feeling that, thank God it wasn't a dud, and an almost immediate horror of what had really happened. It did bring home to one how powerful this is. The treated humans as matter. Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. The first uranium bomb exploded with a light so bright it could have been seen from another planet. More than 100,000 killed, 40,000 injured, 20,000 missing. Burns, blindness, radiation sickness. It took only nine seconds. Today, even now, the victims still suffer and die. Three days later, a second bomb, a plutonium bomb, dropped on Nagasaki. 80,000 dead. In early September, a scientific team from Los Alamos was sent to Japan to study the effects of the two bombs. One member of the team was Robert Serber. Well, you know, everybody you have defense, defense mechanisms of some kind that build up I mean, uh, under, under any uh, under stresses of that kind, somehow you, uh, you get hardened to it in a couple of days, no matter what you see. And uh, you manage 
you manage to survive that way. I'm sure it happens to all soldiers in all wars. But the, uh, I mean, the thing that was really astonishing about the whole thing was, for instance, that uh, Bill Penny and I wandered around Nagasaki and, like, and Hiroshima, you know, for several weeks, uh, complete, you know, completely alone on our, on our own, and the, we had no difficulty at all with the people. They were you know, perfectly friendly. Not well, let's say, not really friendly, but 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 there was no antagonism visible. We wandered around the ruins among people whose families had all been killed. We had no feeling of danger at all. It's a piece of the wall of a schoolhouse in the schoolroom in Hiroshima, which about half a mile from uh, where the bomb went off, and it's flash burned, and scarred by broken glass, and you can see the shadows of the uh, of the window sash and the and the uh, and the cord of the uh, shade and and from the the angle of which this shadow was cast we could me we could measure the height at which the bomb went, went off and this was the evidence that it really went off at the height it was supposed to in Hiroshima <laughs> After this was all over, about two years later, Oppenheimer gave a talk, I think, at MIT. It was then afterwards republished and quoted all over the world and became one of his most famous utterances. And it said, roughly, the physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. And it became a kind of motif for the, for the, for the, for, for the whole community of physicists, and there were violent arguments. Many people who had been at Los Alamos were very angry. They said Oppenheimer has no right to weep in public for our sins. What we were doing was an honest piece of technical work to win the war. We were no more guilty than anybody else who built weapons in order to win the war. And he has no right to talk about our having sinned. At the end of the war, then, I gave up my uh, clearance and have not worked on, didn't work on nuclear energy in any, uh, in any of its aspect on the development or on bombs. Um, I, I don't, it's, it's somehow, um, I can't feel that it was something that I should, would not have done, um, uh, or should not have done at the time, that is, that the, um, that the reasons for doing it, the, the worry about Fascism, the, um, were, were quite valid. The sense that um, there was almost no way of stopping this from being done. Uh, I think it would have been good to have stopped a little sooner, maybe after VE Day. I think it certainly would have been good never to have um, used the thing on the city, uh, and certainly never to have used two of them. They were poised to land on the beaches of Japan. And they knew that the number of casualties would be astronomical. Those people were happy for the bomb, believe me. I was supposed to build some sample catching equipment to go on the third shot, which was to be dropped on Japan, and I was to go with it. However, as you know, Japan gave up before there was a third shot. Dear Hokan, your letter, your marvelous warm letter, was one of the very few things that brought warmth to us over these troubled days. A few days after the surrender, we went over to our ranch for a little time of solitude, horses, and the slow return to sanity. We are not sure we'll be coming back to Berkeley for a permanent, despite the ties that make us want to. We are not too sure of anything personal, longing, both of us, so much for stability, yet knowing that we have been put in a time and a place where we may not be able in conscience to attain it. The circumstances are heavy with misgiving 
them far, far more difficult than they should be, had we power to remake the world to be as we think it. The veil of secrecy was lifted, and most Americans believed the atomic bomb had played a decisive role in ending the war. The scholarly professor, the unworldly student of metaphysical poetry, the former leftist, was suddenly a national hero, a celebrity, father of the atomic bomb. In 1947, he was appointed director of the prestigious Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. He was Einstein's boss. But much of his time in the post-war years was spent in Washington, where his counsel was eagerly sought at the highest levels of government. He served on two dozen committees, testified frequently before Congress, and was even asked to run for public office. Although he advised the government on its atomic arsenal, he argued adamantly and publicly for the international control of atomic weapons. And his sense of what he wanted to accomplish when he was in the government had less to do with physics than it had to do with, uh, with the, with the um, uh, sensible use of, the, of this awful instrument that we'd made. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night? I am afraid that the answer to that question is yes. I have been asked whether... Oppenheimer tried to maintain control of the atomic energy enterprise to prevent the Air Force from abusing the weapons that he had created. I think the only hope for our future safety must lie in a collaboration based on confidence and good faith with the other peoples of the world. I think he felt that he wanted to make a big difference. Um, I would argue, I argued with him quite a lot after the war. Um, I felt that the, um, the kind of big difference would happen if one really taught people a lot about the, the, the dangers of the bomb, about the possibilities of cooperation. He said there wasn't time for this. He'd been in the Washington scene. He saw that everything was moving. He felt that he had to change things. Um, from within. History again and again shows that we have no monopoly on ideas, but we do better with them than most other countries. He was a philosopher king in his own mind, a man of wisdom who could get along with other men of wisdom who also had power. He had the way of impressing himself very strongly as a wise man on people who were influential. But it is certainly not possible to take the definition of atomic energy and the prohibition against indus helping other nations industrially, literally. It is certainly not possible to do that, Mr. Senator, because everything we do is contrary to it. Everything we do is what? Contrary to it. It was a different world after the war. Americans perceived a new threat, Russian and Chinese communism. Arms control was an unpopular idea, even before the Russians shocked America by exploding their own atomic bomb in 1949, far sooner than anyone expected. The arms race began in earnest, and Oppenheimer's Council for International Collaboration was now less attractive to policymakers than the advice of his fellow scientist, Edward Teller. Even during the war years at Los Alamos, Teller had urged the development of a secret weapon, radically different and radically more destructive than the atom bomb, the hydrogen bomb. The General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission, chaired by Oppenheimer, issued a secret report opposing immediate development of the hydrogen bomb on both technical and moral grounds. I'm sure he thought that there was absolutely no need for the hydrogen bomb, that there was no need really for any of these bombs. And he felt that way, even though he had worked on, on the arsenal of, of, of fission bombs. 
Despite the committee's advice, President Truman initiated a program to develop the hydrogen bomb, and scientists at Los Alamos began to design the new device. Robert Oppenheimer was not among them. This is an atomic bomb, about the size of the one that devastated Hiroshima. By 1950, it was considered too small for our defense. The hydrogen bomb being developed would have 1,000 times the destructive force. One morning in November of 1952, the Pacific island of Alugalab was vaporized by the first hydrogen blast. All that remained was a mile-wide crater on the ocean floor. A disbelieving America saw the Russians explode a hydrogen bomb within the same year. There are no secrets uh, insofar as atomic and hydrogen bomb development is concerned from the communists. I, think, I don't think we have any secrets from them at all. Senator McCarthy's anti-communism dominated the 1950s. When he mentioned Oppenheimer's left-wing past publicly, it meant to some that Oppenheimer was fair game. Affidavits to the effect that he had been a member of the party, that he had recommended uh, communists for work in the A-bomb and H-bomb plants. Uh, a lot of close relatives, of course, communists. That doesn't, again, doesn't make him a communist. But his wife uh, admittedly was a... Uh, the wife of uh, an official of the Communist Party, uh, brother a very active communist. You know, that's you McCarthy did not attack Oppenheimer directly, but he had helped create the climate that prompted President Eisenhower to seriously consider a letter from a former congressional aide charging that Oppenheimer was a Russian spy. Thirteen years of surveillance by campus police, the FBI, military intelligence. Wiretaps, reports from informants. As many as five agents shadowed him in a single day. Most of it was old news, material disregarded in the past by General Groves and others when Oppenheimer was considered essential. But in 1953, when presented with a thick dossier, Eisenhower immediately ordered Oppenheimer's clearance suspended pending a hearing. He had very much the feeling that he was giving the best to the United States in the years during the war and after the war. In my personal opinion, he did, but it, others did not agree. And in 1954, he was hauled before a tribunal and accused of being a security risk, a risk to the United States, a risk to betray secrets. The proceedings were conducted by the Atomic Energy Commission in secret. There were no photographers, no reporters, no television. Even Oppenheimer's attorneys were excluded when classified material was discussed. At issue was whether Robert Oppenheimer, principal architect of the atomic bomb, could be trusted with state secrets. Along with numerous accusations relating to his left-wing past, Oppenheimer was specifically accused of opposing the hydrogen bomb on technical, political, and moral grounds, and of having misled security officers in matters relating to his old friend, Hokan Chevalier. During the war, Oppenheimer had reported George Eltonton's attempts to share secrets with the Russians. He told the story in such an ambiguous way that intelligence officers were left with the impression that Hokan Chevalier was the center of a spy ring and that he had contacted several physicists. This mysterious fabrication was to cost the unwitting Chevalier his job and was the most damaging evidence presented at Oppenheimer's hearing. This friend of mine who was the closest human being to me, really, uh, at that time, that he had betrayed me in this way and told about me uh, a lie which uh, 
constituted, uh, if this had been true, it would have been a criminal conspiracy for which I would have been, I could have been sentenced to a prolonged prison term. Oppenheimer never explained to Chevalier, nor to anyone else, why he had for 13 years failed to undo the lie. Also damaging to Oppenheimer was the testimony of his former Los Alamos colleague, Edward Teller. The father of the hydrogen bomb had previously complained to government attorneys that Oppenheimer was a complex and vain man who had for moral reasons impeded development of the hydrogen bomb. Teller was somewhat more restrained at the hearing, but he did testify that Oppenheimer should not be granted clearance. Although the majority of witnesses, Nobel laureates, government advisors, even General Groves came to Oppenheimer's defense, it was to no avail. The Atomic Energy Commission found that Oppenheimer was a security risk and his clearance was never restored. He was never again asked to advise the government of the United States and he never again worked in nuclear energy. He was not the same person afterwards. I think it really knocked him for a loop. Uh, he, w he, f he felt frustrated in accomplishing what he hoped to do in the way of, of getting peace. He felt um, really injured by not being part of the, of the, by not being respected in government and official circles. He wanted to get back into that, I think. Um, I don't know why, but, uh, but I, I think it's one of these things where there's a, where you get the taste of it, it's hard to, to not want it. I think to a certain extent it actually almost killed him, spiritually, yes. It, it achieved just what his opponents wanted to achieve. It destroyed him. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, could you tell us uh, what your thoughts are about what our atomic policy should be? No, I, I, I can't do that. I'm not, not close enough to the facts, and I'm not close enough to the, to the thoughts of those who are worrying about it. What your thoughts are about the uh, proposal of Senator Robert Kennedy that uh, President Johnson uh, initiate talks with a view to uh, halt the spread of nuclear weapons? It's uh, 20 years too late. It should have been done the day after Trinity. The atomic bomb Robert Oppenheimer built and the hydrogen bomb he hoped could never be built are now facts of life. Since the Trinity blast in 1945, there have been more than 1,200 nuclear explosions on the face of the Earth. The largest has 4,000 times the force of the bomb that leveled Hiroshima. I have felt it myself, the glitter of nuclear weapons. It is irresistible if you come to them as a scientist, to feel it's there in your hands to release this energy that fuels the stars, to let it do your bidding, and to perform these miracles to lift a million tons of rock into the sky. It, it is something that gives people an illusion of illimitable power, and it is in some ways responsible for all our troubles, I would say. This, what you might call technical arrogance that overcomes people when they see what they can do with their minds. may live on for a while and 
the differences between us and any possible opponent are not that great. In fact, I don't know any part of history where it could be proper to use one of those very powerful bombs. Nothing turned out quite as well as one thought it would. During the war, we all thought that with this um, device, which was a thousand times more powerful than anything else, we could really influence the way nations talked about war. And this is what my brother was so involved with after the war, because there, was no, there were no vested interests, there were no manufacturers of atomic bombs. Nobody knew about it. One said, here is a fresh start and uh, a weapon that you can't use for war. Um, we can, it, it can produce a change, but it didn't. Uh, everybody regards the atomic bomb as just another weapon as part of our security. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. 